Here's another AP FRQ that is non-calculator, a very common theme of one of the other videos that you may or may not have watched already, which is looking at the fundamental theorem of calculus, looking at a curve analysis from a completely visual standpoint. I actually think this one is easier than the one in the other video that you might have watched that goes through a lot of the similar questions, but uh, this one is a little less involved in Part D uh, compared to the other one. So if you haven't tried the other one, you might want to try this one and then see how you feel about the two of them. Um, but again, it's asking you to make the relationship between f and g and integrals and derivatives and use a picture to answer a lot of questions. Uh, this problem also came from the publishing company that does our weekly problems, so you can expect that it's pretty consistent with what you're going to see on the AP test. So this problem is giving you a graph of f like most of them do and then telling you what g of x is equal. Slight difference here, g of x isn't just equal to the integral, it's equal to negative x plus an integral. So when I write, write my relationship, the idea is that when you derive derive g of x, you're not just going to get f of x, you're going to get negative 1, because that's the integral of neg or that's the derivative of negative x, plus f of x. And then when you derive again, you're going to end up with just f prime of x, because the derivative of negative 1 will be 0. So you still want to write that relationship, it just has a slight difference, a little twist in it, that it's not just an integral, it has something else in front, which you have to include when you derive it. So part A is going to ask you to do g of 3 and g prime of 3, which by now we're probably pretty comfortable with using our picture for a lot of it, doing a lot of the geometric work. So coming over here for part A, and again it might help to kind of write that relationship again, so g prime of x is equal to, pen's going crazy on me, is equal to negative 1 plus f of x and then g double prime of x is equal to f prime of x. So first thing it's asking me to do is find g of 3. So g of 3 means that I'm using that original integral equation. So instead of negative x, I'm going to type in, put in negative 3, putting 3 in for x, and then the integral from 2 to 3 of f of t. So I'm going to need my picture because I need to figure out the integral from 2 to 3. So that is this very small triangle. Uh, my triangle is 1 half base times height, so 1 half of 1 times 1. So I'm going to get negative 3 plus a half, giving me an answer of negative 2 and a half. I can write it as negative 5 halves. I can write it as negative 2.5 anything that is equivalent to negative two and a half, and that will give you a point. And again, get in the habit of writing down what you just found. You just found g of three, you put three in all the appropriate places, and then you found your answer. To find g prime of three, g prime of three, using this line, g prime of three equals negative one plus f of three. So again, I'm using my picture, but this time I'm not doing a anything with geometric. I just want to find out what happens when I put 3 into my function. When I put 3 into my function, I get a height of 1, so I get negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. They did not ask for anything with g double prime, which kind of surprised me on this question. Usually that's the very next thing to ask. What about g double prime of 3? Um, if that's the case, you would just be finding the slope of the graph there. So looking at this picture, g double prime of 3 would have a slope of 1, so it would just be 1. Um, kind of surprised they didn't ask that question because they usually do in other ones, but I think we're all ready to answer that question if that is asked. Uh, part A, I believe, would be worth two points uh, because you are just finding two things. They could put a third point in there showing that you derived it correctly, that you have g prime equals negative 1 plus f of x. So you really want to make sure you take time to write that because that could end up being one of the rubric points. For Part B, it wants to know the x-coordinate of the critical points and then show how we got those answers. So first I want to write that in order to find a, a critical value, I need the derivative to equal 0. And I've already written before, and I'm going to write it again, that the derivative equals negative 1 plus f of x. And so what this is saying is when does that equal 0? What that means is if I add 1 to both sides, what I'm looking for is when does f of x 
equal 1. So when they say the computation that leads to your answer, that's your computation that you wrote down that you're looking to find the derivative equal to 0. You know the derivative of g is equivalent to negative 1 plus f of x. You set that equal to 0, and we can say that we're looking for when f of x equals 1. What that means from a visual st uh, standpoint is I'm looking at my picture to see what times, what x values, do we have a height of 1. And it happens here, it happens here, and it happens here. So my critical values are x equals 1, x equals 3, and x equals 4 and a half. Part B uh, potentially could be the part that is worth um, at least two, but I would say probably three points uh, because you have to show that computation and you have more than one critical value. You're not just getting one answer. So this, this part could potentially be worth three points because you have more work and more things to find. Part C is the easiest part, and it was uh, also a part that surprised me. I was expecting it to ask even more questions. All part C wanted you to do was find the second derivative of g in terms of f, which I'm sure when you look at this problem, you probably do at the very beginning. You just don't realize that that's going to be one of the parts, and that's it on C. So if you look at what we already discussed, our relationship, so we realize that from the previous slide, g prime equaled 1 plus f prime of x, then g double prime is equivalent to, or this is just f of x, g of prime of x is 1 plus f of x, so g double prime of x is f prime of x. That's all they wanted in part C. Kind of surprising. I would have expected maybe them to go further and say, now that we have that, what's g double prime of 3 or 2 or 5 or something like that, where you're actually asked to find the slope of the graph because that's done so often. But in this particular problem, they just wanted you to show that you understood the relationship between g and f. This, to me, would only be one worth one point. You either have that relationship or you don't. Part D, from each critical point that we found in Part B, so those were the points x equals 1, x equals 3, and x equals 4 and a half, we want to figure out if they are relative minimums, relative maximums, neither, and then justify why they are what we think they are. So the first thing I did is I went through each one one at a time and wrote x equals 1. If you think about what happens when x equals 1, so let me write my derivative statement again. So derivative g prime of x is equivalent to 1 plus f of x. What I did to prove what's happening here is I looked at test values. I looked at what happened before 1 and what happened after 1. So I looked at what happened at g prime of 0. g prime of 0 would be 1 plus f of 0, and f of 0 is 2, looking at my graph. So I have a positive derivative at 0. If I look after 0, if I look, for example, or after 1, if I look at what happens at 2, after the critical value, I get 1 plus f of 2, and f of 2 from my picture is, um, is 0. Where is my value here? I get 1 plus f of 2. Oh, these are negative ones. I'm sorry. I knew there was something off there. So this would be negative 1. So I have negative 1 plus 2, which is 1, which is a positive. And then I have negative 1 plus 0, which is negative 1, which is a negative. So since my derivative, g prime, switched from positive to negative, I know that negative that x equals 1 is a maximum. So I wrote down that x equals 1 is a maximum. And my justification is because g prime of x switches from positive to negative around that point, around that critical value. Because we had, when I put 0 into g prime, I got a positive value. When I put 2 into g prime, I got a negative value. Sorry about the negative that went astray there. Then I did the same thing for x equals 3. I know I'm kind of running out of room on my screen, so I'm going to come up here. I know that before 3, because I just checked it, I get a negative value. So g prime goes from negative, and then I can see, well, what happens at 4? What happens to g prime of 4? g prime of 4 would be negative 1 plus f of 4, and if I look at my picture, f of 4 is 2. So I'm back to a positive value. So what that tells me is at 3, I am switching from a negative derivative to a positive derivative, so this must be a minimum. So we have a minimum because g prime of x switches from negative to positive. 
And then finally, I got to check four and a half. So I'll, I'll come way up top here. X equals four and a half. Well, I know prior to four and a half, like four, which I just checked, I had a positive. And let's see what happens at five. If I want to figure out what is g prime of five, I would get negative one plus f of 5, and f of 5 is 0, so I'm back to a negative. So it does switch every single time. So I do actually end up with all critical values that produce extrema. So I can say that this would be a maximum because g prime of x switches from positive to negative. So I'm setting up intervals. The one thing I do have to keep in mind is I have to look at that fact that there's that negative 1 plus. Uh, so I'm looking to see, um, I'm taking that in consideration when I'm figuring out if things are positive or negative. And so really your wording, and you don't have to have all the computation to get full credit here. You just have to use the correct language. So for example, when you have x equals 1, to get full credit, all you have to say is we have a maximum because g prime switches from positive to negative. At x equals 3, we have a minimum because g prime switches from negative to positive. And then at x equals 4 and a half, we have a maximum because g prime switches from positive to negative. Uh, there is another way to do this problem and it was something that was presented in the solution manual, you could also do a second derivative test. If you wanted to figure out what was happening at x equals 1, you could see what would g double prime would be like at 1. Uh, g double prime at 1 is the slope, so it is negative, which means that x equals 1 is a maximum. So you could definitely use the second derivative test, and it would probably be a little bit uh, more efficient. Uh, using that again for x equals 3, x equals 3, the second derivative will be positive because we have a positive slope here. So that means x equals 3 is a minimum. And then x equals 4 and a half, the double prime would be negative because it has a negative slope and that's a maximum. So that one might be even more efficient. This part to me is probably, uh, again, worth three points. So you're looking at part A being worth maybe two points, part B being worth two to three points, part C only being worth one point, and then part D having the potential of being worth two or three points, just kind of whatever they deem to be the most important as far as what they're looking for. I like this problem, again, because it's visual, because it's forcing you to use the fundamental theorem and show all the relationships, because it's forcing you to do a curve analysis as well. And it had a little different twist because it had that negative x in front of the integral, which is a little different than what we're used to.